Since the first line trial was published um, last year in The Lancet, everybody wanted to know the long-term follow-up and this I presented today with a seven-year follow-up. So we have mature long-term data and this is what I presented today. So I showed that uh, in particular what is the most interest the overall survival data. Usually we only show progression-free survival data because the study is not long enough. And now I showed a long-term overall survival data. So for the indolent group, um, the patients with the indolent lymphomas, they tended to be a little survival benefit for the bendamustine rituximab arm. It was not statistically significant. The p-value was 0.08, but still the curve with bendamustine rituximab was above the curve with chop rituximab. So the 10-year estimated survival rate is 72% with bendamustine rituximab and approximately 62%, so 10% less with chop rituximab. So it's uh, very important to see this long-term overall survival data because many people fear that some late toxicity may arise from bendamustin, like secondary malignancy, and maybe that is leading to a death rate, unexpected. So that is very important to show that even with a longer follow-up, the overall survival appears to be really better than compared to the chop R. That is very important, and that is, of course, a very important message when you see the long um, time to next treatment curve also, which I have presented, we needed significantly less second line treatments to achieve this overall survival. So some patients, and this is a majority of the patients, can survive uh, with uh, just one single treatment, which was in that case bendamustin rituximab or in the other arm chop rituximab and that is uh, important without any rituximab maintenance. That study was done in the year 2003. So some patients, bendamustin rituximab, have a very long first remission duration, which translated also into a quite good overall survival. Yes, with a long-term follow-up, you don't see toxicity, of course. What you fear is secondary malignancies that can happen. And that is a big fear of every clinician that maybe the first damage of the chemotherapy of the alkylator treatment may induce a secondary malignancy rate, which then will lead to death. That is the major concern. Um, beyond that, the toxicity happens during the treatment, but when the patient is six months beyond the treatment, probably he has no fatigue, no nausea, no hematotoxicity, and maybe also, as far as I observed, no increased risk of infection, only the typical one what you see in this kind of population. Yes, so we have discussed in this meeting all the new compounds like ibrutinib, idilalisib. I also don't want to forget the old compounds, which are also active. And I introduced data from an Italian study group who combined bendamustin rituximab and RSC, or cytarabine. And this is also very old, typical chemotherapy, but we know it's very effective in mental cell lymphoma. So I showed the uh, results of a phase two study showing a very high efficacy and promising activity in elderly patients with previously untreated and relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. So that was uh, also something which I um, discussed and this is very interesting. Beyond that, of course, the new compounds ibrutinib, idilalisib are being combined with rituximab and also in some studies with bendamustin and rituximab. Um, and this uh, was discussed today, introduced, but we don't have mature results from these ongoing studies. Some small phase two studies results are available, but of course we cannot draw any mature conclusion from the very first phase two results. Um, but that is interesting to see what all is ongoing in the world, combining these new agents with rituximab and uh, also sometimes with the old chemotherapy backbone bendamustin. 
Brentuximab. This was not discussed here on the meeting because Brentuximab is being used in the T cell and in the Hodgkin lymphoma. But I know from American colleagues that in relapsed and refractory Hodgkin's disease, they combined bendamustine and Brentuximab. And they told me from personal communication that this combination is quite effective in otherwise refractory Hodgkin patients. Again, the new compounds and the results, what I heard just in the last talk from David Maloney, the CART um, regimen and the CART tre treatment, that is of course something very new and there's a lot of hope in that. That is interesting. Also, what I would like to see in these meetings discussed is the chemotherapy backbone in the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This is still playing a very important role in the so-called best treatment approach for the patients. And we have these different treatments like the classical R-CHOP21, then we have the additional etoposide or the French regimen ACVBP or the dose-adjusted epoch rituximab. Um, this is, in my opinion, also a very interesting field and I hope that this will address in future meetings again because that is of a very urgent consequence for our next patients who have this disease. The typical patient with an indolent lymphoma, I'm going to tell that we have to treat him when he needs treatment with the classical chemotherapy rituximab and then the time after that when he has a remission duration um, is um, um, having is showing benefit for him because we develop more new things so I tell him today we need to treat you and we need to treat with the old established regimen but the time will work for the patient because we have so many new developments which will be clearly available when the patient needs another treatment. So I tell him he has a reason to have good hope um, because we have, in most circumstances, effective frontline treatment and in the salvage regimens we have so many new things which will be available in the near future.